sure that the work on local governance and governance for that matter is never ending. It is a journey. And it is always a, a challenge to everyone who is into this to continuously seek improving everything as, as, as we move on. Now, kaya nung sinabi na mag-lecture ako on governance, personally, my work in local governance actually started in the 80s uh, under a program called Local Resource Management. It is, therefore, walang local government code. Yun yung panahon na kahit sabi ng ibang may, are there local officials here? <laughs> but he is young. Uh, you know, unang panahon, baka hindi, mas maraming bata ako kasi dito, just a little journey back in time. Nung panahon na yun, sabi ng iba, kahit bumili ka ng isang ring ng one paper, kailangan mo magpaalam sa Manila kung ikaw ay local official. Because the system was too centralized. So at that time, I, I was with the Development Academy of the Philippines and I get to, to be introduced to local governments in the hinterlands of Antique, Southern Leyte, Eastern Samar. And yung mga, they, were, they used to be the 20 poorest provinces at that time in the mid-80s. Uh, doon nakikita talaga ang kakulangan ng servisyo at ang, ang kahirapan ng isang local official to respond to the requirements because of limitations in resources, human resources, financial resources, saka yung wala talagang power and authority to act on something. It is a very centralized system. Wala pa hong era noon. So, imagine nyo lang, walang era. Saan siya kumukuha? Hindi doon sa kanyang maliit na koleksyon. 1992 changed it all. Or 91, I should say. When the local government called was fast and things nag -iba. Uh, Nag-iba na rin ang uh, relasyon ng national government at ng local government. And, and here, I'd like to start by introducing by law, the DILG today is an extension of the powers of the President. So parang, we exercise a delegated function to oversee local government units on behalf of the President. That used to be not the case. The DILG really ran the local governments of the country. The DILG exercises general supervision over NGOs and is mandated to help raise local capacities to perform and expectations under the local government code of 91. Ang gusto ko lang bigyan ng pansin dyan, the word general supervision. We don't control LGUs today. Control. Control is you make decision on their behalf. General supervision is just ensuring that they follow the law. Prior to 91, it is the other way around. It is the national government that makes decisions on what happens in every corner of our country. You see on the slide the vision and mission of the department. We are organized to perform two very important functions. We ensure public safety and peace and order, which is the interior part of our work, and we assist the President in exercising general supervision over the strengthening the capacities of the LGUs to do their jobs well, which is the local government function. They take care of the local government function. The Department has to do its oversight roles on the political subdivisions of the country, 81 provinces, 145 cities, 1,489 municipalities, and 42,000 barangays. We have general supervision, including the power to enforce discipline over local elected officials. Take note, we just enforce discipline. The one who disciplines them is not the ILG, it's the courts. The woodsman, the court, is the president. So, taga implement ng po kami. Nagpapagkamalan po minsan na kami yung nagdindisiplina disiplina kaya gusto ng ibang mamamayan. Di ILG, nagreklamo kami sa inyo dahil si Mayor ay ganito, ay ganito. Hindi ho pwedeng gampanan ka agad ng DILG, natanggalin si Mayor, isuspending, hindi ho yun ang ating batas. Kailangan dumaan sila sa tamang proseso. Which creates actually some, uh, shall we say, dissatisfaction on the part of our people. Pero ganun ang ating sistema. Overall, we're talking of 14,000 municipal government officials, 1,400 city government officials, or, or roughly around 17,000 local elected officials ang ating uh, saklaw. So each LGU level is vested with specific sets of devolved functions or regulatory powers, which you see on the screen. And this is based on the local government code. 
there, there you see the devolved functions of barangay, cities, and municipalities. So, uh, next slide, you see the functions of devolved to the provinces. Although the local government code has not been amended, the scope of devolved functions has in fact been expanded by other laws. Madami na hong nagbago na rin dyan, like the Disaster Law, Clean Air Act, Solid Waste Management Act, etc. Finally, here on the slide are the regulatory powers devolved to the LCUs, which includes the reclassification of lands, enforcement of environmental laws, and the National Building Code, and operation of tricycles, or motorboats, and cockpits, among others. So, I just want to uh, put this into context para makita natin yung latag ng ating uh, mga local government. Ano ba talagang ginagawa nila? Anong pwedeng gawin? Ano rin ang hindi pwedeng gawin? So, the role that we play in the national government is to help local governments carry out their functions. Precisely that. And these efforts to make that happen, uh, you can see this probably along two distinct continuing as well uh, uh, efforts. The first part, I, which I divided uh, this, uh, the transitions of local governance since the code was passed, can be into two shifts. No? The first being the period of building local capacities and the next wave being the era of performance. When the local government code was enacted in 91, the assumption was LGUs were better placed to facilitate development in local communities and foster vibrant local democracies. The only hurdle then was local capacity. Ang paniwala natin noon, para bumulusok ang mga pamahalang lokal sa ilalim ng malawakang kapangyarihan, puspusang pagsasanay at walang humpay na capacity building ang kailangan. The solution was to build NGO capacities through largely centrally driven capacity building program. This is the story of the DILG for more than a decade. Yan ang kwento ng pagsasanay. Even we have, even have an institution to deal with that, the local government academy. But we all know that raising capacities is not enough. We have to move LGUs eventually towards performance. We have to assess to know where LGUs were good or weak at. So fast forward to 20. 2010 until the present, two decades after the code, came the innovation of having criteria-driven, evidence-based performance incentive systems for LGUs. More than raising capacities, there had to be room for LGUs to behave in acceptable norms, and the intervention was no longer training only or capacity building, but the use of incentives. Ito ang kwento ng performance, which has characterized our relationship with LGUs Actually, starting in 2007 and until today. To know more where LGUs are at now, 25 years after the local government code was passed into law, so ano na ba ang nagbago after 25 years? How do LGUs fare compared to when local autonomy and devolutions were introduced in 1991? Foremost, we have to understand local autonomy and devolution as a continual political and institutional reforms over the last 25 years and moving forward into the future. Malaki na ang nagbago sa usaping local na autonomia o pagsasarili. Devolution has been fairly supported not only by 25 years of experience in building LGU capacities, but also by providing more resources to LGUs to perform better. For example, may pera na para suportahan ang cost of devolution kahit na di sapat ito noong 1992 when ERA was only 28 billion. But ERA has been increasing since 2010. In fact, it is now 487 billion for 2007, more than doubling the ERA in 2010, as you see on the slide. From 431 pesos ERA per capita in 1992 at the start of the code, we now have 4,638 per capita in 2017. Of course, there are inequities in the ERA that have long been studied and proposed to Congress for consideration in amending the code. And there are several bills on this at the moment. For example, also, 90% of barangays have ERA less than 3 million pesos and 51% of cities and 91% of municipalities are era dependent for 70% of their budgets. We also have to note that collection of business fees and real property taxes have now increased, mainly a function of our expanding economy. So in, so in the last five years, national government downloaded roughly 93 billion pesos to municipalities and cities for poverty reduction. In 2017, we have more resources available for LGUs. For example, the assistance to provinces will increase to 18 billion pesos. 
in so far as to improving conditions of core local roads and connect this with national roads under a program called Calzada, which uh, the director of OPDS is spearheading. We also have one billion pesos for the performance challenge fund, another a billion for special local roads fund, and a billion for salin tubing or the water for waterless communities. I'm telling you this because this is just going to show that in, over and above the era, national government likewise provides additional transfers to our local government. NGOs are in a better position now to perform the default functions than before. In fact, the biggest operational issue nowadays is not so much about lack of resources, but how do you execute funded projects on time and according to specifications? Yan na talaga ang ating major challenge sa ngayon sa ating mga local governments. May kulit. Ang tanong, nasaan na tayo ngayon? Ano ang alam natin tungkol sa LGU? Una, kailangan respetuhin at ang magkakaibang katayuan at pinanggagalingan ng pamahalang lokal. We know better how diverse LGUs are in their local conditions as much as in their capacities. So for example, out of the 81 provinces we have, we know that there are 47 provinces within the country's major river basins and therefore more exposed to risks of flooding, storm surge, and landslide. 28 provinces are exposed to shocks and geologic uh, movements. Mayroon din pong 18 provinces in the sea eastern seaboard that are really vulnerable to tsunamis. Example lang po ito. Overlay these clusters with geogra geographies of poverty incidents and poverty magnitude, and one will appreciate the complexity of local challenges and diversity of LGUs in general. Ibig lang sabihin, hindi po talaga dapat ihamping ng pare-pareho ang ating mga LGUs. But even with such diversity, we have to move LGUs to a common standard din po naman. One of these is transparency. So about today, about 14 documents now you see on the screen, are being made available to the public in three conspicuous places in the LGUs, plus uploaded in their websites and the department, meaning DILG's portal for full disclosure policy or FDP. Incidentally, this particular effort was pioneered by the late Secretary Jess Robredo. Yung paglalahat. Ito yung pangpundasyon ng sinasabing matinong pamamahala. Ang pakiusap lang namin sa mga universidad. Ito yung una kong pakiusap at sa mga NGO at CSO at sa mga profesor at mag-aaral ng public management and local governance. Andito na ang mga datos. Tulungan natin ang mga mamamayang intindihin ang technical na informasyon. Kasi hindi po lahat naman ay kayang basahin ang mga naipublish nating mga informasyon. Para naman mapalalim ang pakikilahok sa lokal na pamamahala at maitaas ang level ng ugnayan sa pagitan ng LGU at kaumbayan. We always have a dialogue with our local partners, with our partner CSOs. The main theme is participation. Kailangan makilahok. Ngunit hindi naman sapat yung makilahok lamang sa meeting at makilig at magupo at magsalita. Kailangan may, may maliwanag na pag-uugnayan, may maliwanag na isyo. At kailangan mo sa isyo, datos. Yung datos inilahat na natin na ipalabas natin. Ngunit aminin din namin sa inyo na kailangan namin ng tulong ng lahat upang ito ay mabigyan ng kahulugan para lalong magamit, para makipag-dialogo at makipag-buo uh, ng diskusyon sa ating mga pamahalaan lokal. So iyan siguro ay sa na nakikita namin ang mga universidad, ang mga mag-aaral, mga guro, sa public management schools, ay is uniquely positioned to help in this endeavor. Because you have, of course, the discipline. You have the time as well as the... Uh, academic requirements, if I may say, <laughs> to pursue these kinds of research. Our local governments are likewise very interested to engage. Lalo na kung may translate lang ito sa isang uh, madaling ma magamit ng mga uh, information. We'd likewise have to be very clear as to what is really the scope of local governance that we want to see. So over the years, we now, we develop and the, the department through the efforts of the, the leaders of the department and the staff are work on this and to move towards a, a system called the seal of good local governance uh, today. We now know what mean what we mean by good in local governance. LGUs have to meet a national standards or national standards for good financial housekeeping, which was the most which was the mother of our LGO assessment through the predecessor of the seal of good housekeeping and which was expanded to include disaster preparedness social protection, business friendliness and competitiveness, 
environmental management, and peace and order under this SGLG or Seal of Good Health Code. The power of LGU information is now in the hands of the citizens and there is already a positive effect on LGU behaviors. For example, before the seal was initiated, 480 LGUs obtained adverse financial audit findings from COA. We have better handles now in knowing areas for improvement of LGUs. It is now much more scientific and targeted to And so, I pose these questions to the academic research area number two din. <laughs> ano ang ugnayan ng matino at mahusay na pamamalang lokal sa makabuluhang kaunlaran? What is the strength of association between good local governance and human development? What really resonates well to the public? Does it matter to the people at all? Gaano ba nararamdaman ng taong bayan ang matino at mahusay na pamahalang lokal? <clears throat> Idiiwan ko ang mga katanong ito sa inyong lahat. Second, should we assume that accountability follows transparency? I raise this question in the context of our experience in implementing the full disclosure policy as part of the department's transparency campaign. Incidentally, Dean, maraming salamat ay, in your presentation in Davao, we were in the same forum, where you flashed the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, parang, parang magindanao, when you showed how they comply with the full disclosure. That, uh, and that's an, that's Arn pala, no? So, that would be one of the three that I was telling you about. Na kung saan ay inilahad ng local government ng Arn, ano talaga ang nangyayari at saan niya ginagamit? Kailangan natin magtulungan. Inaasahan namin ang akademya at CSO upang suriin ang mga datos mula sa mga plano, pag-google at pag ng pamalang lokal. Inaasahan din namin kayong upang bumuo ng mga kwentong nakatago sa mga datos. Magtulungan tayong mailabas at hayag ang ating pagsusuri upang higit na maunawahan ng bawat mamamayan at maitaas ang level ng pakikilahok sa mga gawain ng LGU mapalalim at mapalalim ang kwentuhan. In summary, LGUs are far better positioned than before to move forward and address local challenges. They are now better capacitated to perform and initiate innovations. Una, malinaw na binigyan sila ng kapangyarihan makapagsarili sa ilalim ng lokal na autonomiya. Pangalawa, mas mataas na ngayon ang pinansyal na kapasidad ng LGU. At pangatlo, panahon na ng performance. It is time we get results for the resources we make available to LGUs and local communities. Now let me end this lecture addressing the youth, particularly the millennials or those who were born between mid-80s to the late 90s. Please raise your hands. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, in a study by NEDA of the young Filipinos aspirations, 25 years now in the year 2040, the youth envision matatag, maginhawa, at panatag na buhay para sa lahat. The millennials in general are characterized to be individualistic, but Filipino millennials are, have a sense of the collective. For the self, they want to be educated, have a job, and earn just enough, preferably working here in the Philippines rather than overseas. A direct reversal of the experience of the OCW and OFW phenomenon of Generation X, leaving families behind in the last three to four decades. For the collective, they want families to have comfortable life, free of worry and hardships, and living in resilient and vibrant communities. And as I show you this slide showing you how, in general, we wish to transform Philippine society in the medium term, particularly giving primacy, primacy to public safety against human-induced crises such as criminality or exposure to natural disasters and risk, creating secure and decent jobs as a result of sustained economic expansion, and in the process protecting the marginalized who may not be able to enjoy readily or fully the benefits of progress, I wish to pose this question to the millennials and to all of us who will eventually bequeath the reins of government to the next generation. Ano ang hugis o anyo o sakop ng local, local governance na gusto ninyong holmahin para sa inyong generasyon? Kailangan na kayong lumahok sa pag-uusap na ito ngayon. I ask 
because the Filipino millennial is educated, tech savvy, global, and cosmopolitan. The service delivery for local governance that suits the Pinoy millennial could be that, for example, of Valenzuela City. Police clearances and other business fees are done online 24-7 and paid through APS or Express Payment System where services are not queued for but transacted real-time. The accountability mechanisms of the Pinoy Millennial might be instantaneous in spaces beyond territorial LGUs and jurisdictions. And so, social media is the space to call attention to unjust so social conditions. They call attention to complex situations needing actions by government, like my forever and traffic sites. <laughs> they mobilize community support through texting, especially during Baha and relief situations. And they are the cyber citizens pushing for critical advocacy through blogging and networking. So what is the shape of local transparency of the future beyond our FDE, which I showed to you? Probably that's not relevant anymore. What is the scope and mechanism for exacting local accountability 24-7 in various spaces beyond the structures of traditional bureaucracies and ways of doing things? This is the context, I think, of what I told Dean Kanina. We still require LGUs to follow the mandatory structures that we now prescribe. Do we still go for qualification standards versus competency? What would be the shape really of the bureaucracy, considering that the needs of our new, of the next generation is vastly different from what our needs today, which has also changed a lot from 91. So, kailangan may ambag ang mga kabataan sa mga usaping nakaka-apekto sa kanilang kinabukasan. Kailangan